Welcome back, Mother Flowers, to another installment of Gutter Fighting Secrets. Today, what we're going to be looking at is the history of Krav Maga. For those of you who don't know already, Krav Maga is an Israeli system of reality-based self-defense. When we translate Krav Maga from Hebrew to English, what it literally means is close contact. And this system was developed by a man named Emi Lichtenfeld. Emi was born in 1910 in Budapest, Hungary, but he grew up in Czechoslovakia. His father, Samuel Lichtenfeld, was chief detective of the Bratislava Police Department. Now, Samuel was kind of famous around Europe for the amount of homicide cases that he had worked and also solved. But in addition to being the chief detective for the Bratislava Police Department, Samuel also opened up the first gym in Europe for exercise as well as self-defense training. Now, the name of this gym was Hercules. And in Hercules, Samuel trained many policemen and many different police departments in self-defense tactics. So, Emi grew up on the mats watching all of this training go down and also training in various arts. As a young man, he was a European boxing champion. He also earned black belts in both judo and Japanese jiu-jitsu and later would go on to compete with Slovakia's national wrestling team and ultimately would earn multiple championship titles in wrestling. Now, besides from just being a sports fighter, Emmy was also a avid dancer from what I understand and just kind of a physical fitness guy. He really understood the science of exercise and physical fitness. So in the 1930s, the Nazi ideals kind of started taking roots in Europe. Adolf Hitler was uh, starting to gain more and more power, and there was a lot of anti-Semitism going around. Now by about 1936, you had groups like the Brown Shirts going around and really just targeting and terrorizing the Jewish communities in Europe. Now Emi saw this, and he said, fuck that and joined loosely organized Jewish resistance groups, primarily organized of other young men who would engage in retaliatory strikes towards these brown shirts. Mainly hit and run type of operations, but also defensive operations against like gang attacks and people being ganged up on and victimized by these fucking cowards. So it was in these operations that Emi started to realize kind of the difference between sports fighting and reality-based fighting or close combat in the streets. He started to understand the difference between, you know, one-on-one -on -one fighting and then fighting multiple attackers, people armed with knives, sticks, you know, and even guns as well. It is important to note here that one of the first things that the Nazis did when they started coming to power was implement strict gun control laws. So these Jewish resistance fighters in Europe did not have access at all to firearms. They relied mostly and primarily on empty hands versus weapons or, you know, empty hands versus empty hands, stuff like that. If they had had access in the first place to firearms, who knows how things might have turned out differently. But they didn't. So in 1940, just before the Nazis officially invaded Czechoslovakia, Emi had to flee. And he ended up getting on board a refugee ferry and going to Palestine. Which, just for those of you out there who aren't aware, before Israel was officially recognized as Israel, it was all Palestine. And back then, the Brits owned and controlled Palestine. So he joined the British Army's Czech Brigade. He went on to fight on the Egyptian front with the British Army's Czech Brigade. It was through joining the British Army that, you know, he got his firearms training, his military training. No doubt he was definitely influenced by the system we know today as gutter fighting as well, which was taught to the British Army back then. He would have learned about bayonet fighting, sentry removal, that type of thing. And also, you know, fighting on the Egyptian fronts, he would have directly been in combat with the Germans as well thus providing him even more insight into the realities of combat. So, after the war, he was still living in Palestine, and naturally fell into the militias that were organized there. And from what I understand, kind of the main body of these militias was known as the Haganah. Now, my Hebrew is a bit rusty, but I believe Haganah translates into, like, defense. Uh, you guys out there who met a very Vreet better than me can definitely correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Just, uh, please do it in English, because I don't read any Hebrew. So, from what I understand, the Haganah was like the main body of these militias, but they were also broken down and organized into smaller units. Just on a side note to kind of explain here, Israel back then must have kind of been like living in the Wild West. You know, you had these different settlements and colonies spread throughout the, uh, the land out there, and the Arab population probably was not too happy that they were there. So there was probably sporadic fighting and defensive measures that had to be taken throughout these settlements. So anyway, there were different units that these militias were broken down into, and the militia that Emi belonged to was apparently named the Palmach. 
1948, the reestablishment of Israel was officially announced, and the Arab-Israeli War began. Roughly 250,000 Palestinian Arabs were expelled or fled from Palestine and Israel's neighbors, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, they were not too happy about this. So once again, Mr. Lichtenfeld found himself in the middle of conflict. Now I meant to say this before I mentioned the Arab-Israeli war, but when Mr. Lichtenfeld joined the Haganah after World War II, it was discovered that he was an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat and martial arts. So they put him in charge of training the militiamen in hand-to-hand -hand combat and survival skills. And during the Arab-Israeli war, his loosely based system proved highly effective. After the Israelis had won the war and Israel was officially recognized as a country, the Haganah turned into the IDF, or Israeli Defense Forces. Mr. Lichtenfeld was subsequently commissioned as chief training officer in charge of all hand-to-hand -hand combatives programs, as well as physical training programs, for the Israeli Defense Forces. And he wrote their hand-to-hand -hand combatives training manual. I would like to note that even after he wrote the manual, he still claimed that his system was not yet fully developed and that it was a work in progress. But he was commissioned to train special units in the IDF and he personally oversaw their training. He more than likely would have worked with units like newly formed Mossad, which is Israel's CIA or intelligence services, which after World War II, were commissioned to go hunt down Nazi war criminals and assassinate them and cool shit like that. So he would personally go and train these special units. This training yielded such exceptional results that he was also put in charge of training other units like the police, bodyguard services, or Israel's secret service, and various other departments from the armed forces as well. Emmy retired from the army in 1967, and at that point there was no Krav Maga as we know it today. The thing is, he only spent like one or two weeks with each unit that he was training, so he didn't really ever have enough time to make a whole complete system. But after he retired, he decided that he was going to go ahead and do just that. He wanted to make a system that was applicable for not only the army and the police and whatnot, but also for the Israeli civilians. Uh, the thing is, you know, he saw the way that his people were victimized in World War II and whatnot, and he didn't want that to ever happen again. And that's kind of been the mentality of Israel ever since it was founded for the second time. So he wanted to also be able to go ahead and teach this to the civilians there in Israel. And considering how dangerous of a place Israel can be, it's probably a good idea that the civilians go ahead and learn Krav Maga. And they do. They study it in school. They study it in the army, which is mandatory for them for at least two years each after high school. So the majority of Israeli citizens, you know, all know Krav Maga pretty decently with the exception of, you know, some of the religious Jewish people who uh, don't go to the army and they don't study this stuff. They they do um, what's called yeshiva instead, which is like the school they go to to learn the Bible, the Torah, whatever, and they just they study religion their whole lives. But the majority of the Israeli citizens all since school um, will be learning Krav Maga, so they're, they're pretty badass people. It's definitely a culture that I tend to admire. So anyway, Emmy went ahead and opened up two schools. One in Netanya, which is actually uh, Netanyahu's hometown, and another one in Tel Aviv, which actually up until this year was Israel's capital. Now in each of these two schools, he had about five students each, which he personally trained. In 1971, he finally decided that his system was complete, and only then he named it Krav Maga. Now Krav Maga is a very unique, modern system of hand-to-hand -hand combat. It takes techniques from the military training side of it, and also adapted training techniques from the military thing to the civilian side of things. So he added in like how to flee a situation safely while scanning the area and making sure there weren't, you know, other adversaries behind you before you flee. Things like scanning and looking for the exits. When I went ahead and just got my Krav Maga instructor certification, that was a game that we used to play during the warm-up phase is we'd all run around and they'd say go and we'd all kind of like get to the nearest exit. I thought that was pretty cool actually. Um, Krav's definitely a cool system to, to study. There's a number of companies out there that teach Krav Maga and I'm not necessarily a fan of all of them. I did have a great opportunity while I was in Israel doing a bodyguard school to study Krav in Israel um, and the Krav I learned in Israel was really nothing like the Krav that I was learning when I got this certification. 
but that just kind of shows you that there is definitely the civilian self-defense side of things and then the whole military close combat side of things. And the military side of things tends to be the type of thing, well, you run through him, you kill him, then you stomp on his head just to make sure he's dead, and then civilian application tends to be like, oh, kick him in the nuts, you know, push him away or hit him once or twice, and then, you know, try to run away and, and find the safest place to go. I personally enjoy the whole military aspect of run through him and stomp on his head a little bit more, but to each his own. It's hard for me to go ahead and run away from situations like that, but in certain situations, that's exactly what you need to do. And for your average civilian who isn't going to go ahead and train in martial arts all the time, that's probably, you know, pretty decent advice, to be honest with you. So Immy remained uh, an advisor for the IDF even into his very old age. And in 1998, he passed away at the age of 88 years old and was buried in Netanya, Israel. But Krav Maga remains an extremely efficient system and recognized kind of all over the world, especially here in the United States. And that's thanks in a large part to a man named Darren Levine, who was a student directly under Mr. Emmy Lichtenfeld. He decided in the 1990s that it would be a good idea to bring the Krav system here to America. And at that time, I mean, there were reality-based martial arts, but this was like something that really hadn't been seen before. Uh, unless you served in the military or something like that, you probably wouldn't have the opportunity to get training like this. And especially in the 1980s and 90s as well, there was a lot of BS going around as far as the martial arts arena, so to speak. Um, there were a lot of people out there teaching bullshit stuff, and you know we didn't have the internet really or anything like that to cross-check and reference and say, well, this is BS, it's never going to work. People just didn't think about fighting like that back then, so this was some hardcore killer stuff. From what I understand, law enforcement found out about it, and they loved it. LAPD started training their SWAT teams in it, and from there it kind of spread to departments all over the country. Uh, Counter-terrorist units began training their guys in it, and it also spread, you know, not only to law enforcement side of things, but also to the civilian side of things. I remember when I was about 19, 20 years old, something like that, I was really looking around for anything I could get my hands on as far as reality-based self-defense, and I read an article about Krav in the New York Times, I believe. I was like, oh yeah, that's dope. Let's let's see if I can uh, learn some of that. So I found a school and I took a couple of classes. I did not end up sticking with it because I had the opportunity to train in an art called DAS or Deadly Art of Survival with a fellow by the name of Garnett Stroger, which really is not a very well-known system, but highly, highly, highly effective. Came from the inner cities of New York. But I was very impressed when I did take those couple of classes, and I didn't realize it, but years and years later, I would be studying Krav in Israel, and eventually go on to get certified in the first level of Krav instruction. So, I guess things kind of tend to go full circle. But that's enough about my favorite subject, which is me, and that's probably enough about my second favorite subject, which is martial arts. I'm going to bring this to a close here in a minute. However, that is kind of a brief overview of the history of Krav Maga. I hope you guys learned something from it. I definitely learned a lot making it, which is why I make these damn videos in the first place is because I really love this subject, martial arts. So if you guys love it too, go ahead, give me a thumbs up, subscribe if you like. We'll be deploying new videos as much as possible. I'm going to be doing more and more videos on the histories of different fighting systems from, from around the world. I also have an Instagram, Gutter Fighting Secrets. I tend to put more of my actual hands-on self-defense type techniques up on there lately. But they allocate me like 59 fucking seconds to do it. So any of the longer videos that need more explanation or more details, I'll throw up on this uh, YouTube channel. But for now, I'm doing a lot more of the history type stuff and um, theoretical type stuff as well as practical like instructional videos on this YouTube channel. Just a quick plug. I have a five-part instructional DVD series. It's also available on a single flash drive entitled Travel Safety for Americans Abroad. It's all of what I learned going to bodyguard schools and training with different military units all over the world. Stuff like defensive driving, how to stay safe in a hotel, how to blend in while you're overseas or even here domestically, escape and evasion, how to use things like a pen or a flashlight or a magazine for improvised weapons, you know, some self-defense techniques in there as well, escaping from duct tape, zip ties, uh, there's some seduction techniques in there. You know, real James Bond stuff, just cool secret agent type stuff. 
that's available at www.protriptips.com. And when you order the flash drive, you're also going to go ahead and get Gutter Fighting Secrets, my original self-defense DVD. Uh, that's got some cool stuff in it, too, that you won't find elsewhere. Stuff, actually, I learned in Israel while I was there. So if you are like-minded like me and you want some cool information that you're not going to find from a lot of other sources, then go ahead, check it out, www.protriptips.com. My other website is gutterfightingsecrets.com. So... With that advertisement out of the way, I thank you for listening to it, and I thank you for listening to this video, watching this video, and checking out my channel as well. Um, I just, I really love this subject, like I said a couple times before, and if I can share my passion for martial arts with you guys, uh, and you guys can share your love of it with me, then that's awesome. So, until next time, guys, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense, and I will see you all in the next video. And as they would say in Israel, I'll see you later and peace.